what's all the activity in Southern Africa all about? It's all about the gold. Always about the gold. All ancient cultures tell us that the gold belongs to the gods. Every single one, when they, when they discovered, when the conquistadors and the explorers discovered the ancient cultures, and everyone seems to have huge amounts of gold. But one of the greatest technological examples of ancient technology is the Ark of the Covenant. If you read your Bible, you'll know there was a powerful, powerful device that could smite and kill armies and kill people that touched it. And it was a weird, bloody thing. Trying to figure out what the hell it was. And, um, and it was also obviously a, a receiver and a, and a transmitter because God told Moses to, or Aaron rather, or Moses, I think it was Aaron. Aaron was doing all the talking for Moses, because remember Moses had a speech impediment, he didn't do much talking. A uh, bit of uh, detail that is often forgotten. Um, so, very clear instructions of go and sit between the winged cherubim when, when you want to talk to me and I'll tell you what you must convey to the Israelites. And um, so it was clearly a communication device. And then the golden calf, you know, what did Moses do with the golden calf? when he came down from the mountain. He put it in the fire and he burnt it. But he didn't turn it into molten gold. He turned it into white powder. And then he made the Israelites drink the white powder. And in that moment we realized that even in the Bible we get given the secrets of this golden mystery which I call the golden surprise. It is not about the gold, the shiny yellow metal. It's about the white powder of gold that Moses made as the alchemist. Remember, Moses was a privileged child from the house of the pharaohs that went through the mystery schools. He was an, an alchemist and a wise man of a high standard. He knew how to create monoatomic gold, all this white powder of gold, whatever you want to call it, manna from heaven. This is a very important understanding. Monoatomic gold exists because gold exists as AU2. The one golden atom binds with another golden atom because of the, the valency in the, in the outside orbit. So it actually forms a stable atom as AU2. But if you prevent the one golden atom to bind with the other one, it will bind with something else and you start creating what's referred to as monoatomic gold. And it does weird things. It acts as a superconductor. It conducts information instantly without loss of information or creation of heat. It emits a weird single frequency of light. It heals faulty cells in DNA. It pretty much cures all disease. It, it is an anti-gravity device. It, it, it uh, shows anti-gravity um, properties. When David Hudson created the white powder of gold uh, with MIT, uh, they had a little white pile of white powder inside a tube of inert gas and um, when he put his hand under this little pile of white powder, the pile of white powder lifted up and started to levitate inside the little tube. When they tried it with magnets and iron and even electrical charges, nothing but the human touch made it lift up and elevate. And then they found when they exposed it to heat, at 700 degrees, that little pile of white powder started to disappear. By 800 degrees, it was gone. Not there. They swept the little pan where the white powder was to just make sure that it wasn't just invisible. You know, disperse it. When they started to reduce the temperature, it started to come back. And by 700 degrees, it was back in its place. And you realize that White powder of gold can act as a cloaking device under certain conditions. It moves into a different dimension where it's not no longer here. It goes somewhere else. So it can be used as a cloaking device. And this is what I think Zachariah Sitchin was possibly referring to when he said that the Anunnaki put the gold around their planet not to shield them from cosmic rays and, and X-rays, but rather to shield them from the peering eyes of other beings of higher consciousness so that they were invisible as to what they were doing on this planet shielding their activities from other beings and that brings us to southern Africa and uh, 
We're going to take a break soon. Sorry, it's taken a lot longer with me going slower. So, um, we're going to take a break soon. Not, not yet, just give, give me a... Uh, 11th century, Ahmed al-Biruni describes the prosperous gold exports from the port of Safala. It also shows us the African kingdom of Monomotapa. It's a huge kingdom. The golden kings of Monomotapa, they were never defeated. They had all the gold. And uh, the golden exports from the port of Safala, there's Safala over there, where Mo Mozambique is today. I live about there. <laughs> um, and then we, we're told that the gold was a month's journey inland from the port of Safala. Well, what do you get when you go month journey inland? This is what the modern map looks like. There's Mozambique, there's Zimbabwe, South Africa is just down here. There's Baira, modern town of Baira, where Port of Safala used to be. If you go one month land inwards, where do you get to? You get to Masvingo. What is it, Masvingo? Great Zimbabwe. The house, the capital of the Monopotapa kingdom. The great African golden kings. It is and remains one of the great mind-blowing ancient structures that is so mysterious. When we were there in February, when you walk up, who's here? Um, Ed, Ed is here. He can verify what I'm saying. When you walk up to those big walls, you tap on the walls, they resonate, they go ding. It is almost unimaginable. <laughs> Around the town of Leidenberg in South Africa, about 45 minute drive, drive from me, that's well known for these Leidenberg heads, Mysterious like we had 75,000 gold mines were discovered in 2010. In the 1930s, mysterious tunnels were found by gold miners about 100 feet deep that shouldn't be there. It doesn't make any sense that there would be ancient tunnels. In 1971, between 71 and 75, this pre Inca Viracocha statue of, uh, of Viracocha was found in an underground tunnel in a sinkhole under the town or near the town of Carltonville, linking South American ancient civilizations that had huge amounts of gold to South Africa and across the Atlantic. And um, this is really, this brings us the obsession with gold. What I'm showing you here is that the obsession with gold goes to ancient times and also modern times connected to South Africa because in more recent times in the South African war which is known as the Anglo-Boer war was all about the gold and this man here Cecil John Rhodes um, probably one of the most evil men that's ever lived but we need to love everyone so we have to learn from him so we love you Cecil for showing us what not to do um, if you go read up about him he was probably the most powerful man in the world for about 30 years until he died, I think it was in 1904. Uh, all about the gold. The reason why it was all about the gold because in 1899 the British Empire sent 470,000 troops. Put this into context of the, the Gulf War today. There are about 250,000 troops in the Gulf War in modern days. In 1898 the British Empire sent 470,000 troops to South Africa to secure it for the crown because of the gold. And they were fighting 60,000 farmers on horseback and about 60,000 Native, Native Africans. All because something happened. Something very important happened that they could not let go. They had to secure the situation. And this situation gets explained in this event. On the 4th of June 1900, a train filled with gold was sent by Paul Kruger, the president that was fighting, the rebel president was fighting the British might. Remember that the, the, this South African war remains the most expensive war the British Empire has ever fought. Until today, the most expensive war they have ever fought. 
It is also where, where Winston Churchill was active and where Mahatma Gandhi was active. That's for my longer presentations. I go into detail about the involvement of Winston Churchill and Mahatma Gandhi in the South African War. So you get some very interesting historical activities and figures that were involved there. Uh, but Paul Kruger, you'll know for the Kruger Park. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I got so used to your voice that it became part of me. <laughs> so Paul Kruger filled a train with gold and sent it to the port of Mozambique. The train made it to a town called Machadadorp, which is the town before the town that I live in, Waterfallburfen. Waterfall Burfen, which means upper waterfall. There's also Waterfall Under. These are both towns of Paul Kruger. That's where in Waterfall Under he has his little house, or had his little house, where he controlled the war against the British. And his train of gold mysteriously disappeared when it got to Waterfall Burfen. It remains one of the greatest treasures on earth today. Trillions of dollars filled trained with full trillions of dollars worth of gold. The question we have to ask is, where did Paul Kruger get all this gold from? <laughs> because in 1902, there was not enough gold in all of South Africa or the world to fill several train coaches with gold. Where did Paul Kruger get all his gold from? And I will tell you this after the break. <laughs> So the question was, before the break, where did Paul Kruger get all his gold from? And now I can tell you after the break. I forgot to put the slide here, but I'll tell you about it. What the Boer fighters were doing was they were digging uh, digging tunnels to hide from the British soldiers and uh, during one of those tunnel digging exercises they must have come upon an unexpected discovery another tunnel that they didn't expect and that tunnel was filled with gold and that gold was there for thousands and thousands of years it would be known as Anunnaki gold why do I know this? Because I have a direct link to God. <laughs> the eye in the sky. Technology that shows us where these tunnels are. And um, I've been fortunate enough to have been shown some spectacular evidence of such tunnels that are still there. But I'm not going to tell you where they are. <laughs> so, um, I believe that the Crown, remember the Crown is royal bloodline. They know all about this. They know about the Anunnaki. They know the history of this planet. When they realized Paul Kruger had stumbled upon the Holy Grail, they went, Oh my God, we cannot allow this to continue. He will become the most powerful man on this planet and he will destroy our empire. And this is why they threw 470,000 soldiers at the South African problem to make sure that they got rid of it and re-secured the gold in South Africa. And they did it with great success. And this brings us to other texts. Sooner or later you're going to have to face the Sumerian tablets. And the Sumerian tablets tell us in great detail about Anu, and Lil, and then Ki. And we start seeing the parallels between the Old Testament and the Sumerian texts. And we find that pretty much all the great stories of the Bible are actually written in prehistory and we find their origins in the Sumerian texts. 
from the creation story to Adam and Eve to Noah and the Ark to Sodom and Gomorrah and so it goes. What we also find is in these Sumerian texts is that they refer to this place called the Abzu and the work in the Abzu by Enki and that Abzu is where the gold came from. One of these translations is quite specific. In the Abzu, Enki plans was conceiving where to build his house, where for heroes dwellings to prepare, where the bowels of the earth to enter to dig the gold. This tells us about Enki's house, his mines and his technology. In the midst of the Abzu to a place of pure waters, Enki betook himself. In that land, a place of deepness, he determined for the heroes into earth's bowels to descend. <laughs> the earth splitter, Enki there established. There with in the earth a gash to make. By way of tunnels, earth's inards to reach the golden veins to uncover. It's telling us very clearly. It's telling us very clearly what they were doing and what Enki was in charge of. He was in charge of setting up the world's largest gold mining empire. And I will show you what I believe the earth splitter is with which they made these gashes in the earth. What I forgot to mention earlier that in in the early 90s, um, a researcher in Seattle uh, was told that De Beers a mining company found an ancient mine in South Africa that was about 22,000 feet deep, cut with absolute precision technology that is impossible for us to do today. And when these mining companies find these kind of ancient mines, they cover them up. They don't disclose them. They don't share that with the world. And I know that as well from the chief geologists of Anglo-America who actually told me at a bar over a beer that this is what they do. <laughs> he made it very clear to me that they find they've got a file full of ancient, filled with discoveries of ancient sites. And the instructions are, cover it up. That's it. They do not want to go there, don't want to deal with it. I was having a drink at a bar, at a birthday party, and started talking to this guy. He was the chief geologist of Anglo-America. <laughs> that was Cecil John Rhodes' company, the largest company in the world for about 50 years. And uh, <laughs> the Oppenheimer Empire, not the American Oppenheimer, the South African Oppenheimer. And then we meet uh, Enki and the symbol that's often associated with Enki, the creator god, the one that was responsible for masterminding the creation of a new species, and the symbol deeply encoded with a lot of advanced knowledge. One of the latest um, decodings that I've found is that it, it possibly also gives us, it, it's actually the symbol, the caduceus, that, that symbol is known as the caduceus, if you don't know that. It's used, it's used by the, the medical industry for forever. Right? And yet most doctors and students don't know where that symbol comes from. Um, it's actually a, a symbol of, of, of oppression and also a symbol of, of uh, revelation. It's, it's got a dual purpose. Um, it, it, feeds us with knowledge and information, but at the same time, it, it, it enslaves us. And just like words carry energy, so do symbols. Every symbol carries an energy. So every time you look at the symbol, you are picking up the energy that went into making the symbol, and all the information encoded in that symbol. One of the latest um, conclusions I've reached is that it also represents our enslavement 
through taking control of our uh, anatomy, um, other than just the DNA and the obvious stuff, but through our nervous system, specifically the parasympathetic nervous system. Because if you can control that, you control the needs and the desires of a species. And uh, the question arises, you know, and, and I'll, I'll refer you to William Brown, in my opinion, the world's greatest geneticist and molecular biologist in the world today. Um, he takes Bruce Lipton's work to a whole new level. Uh, and he's in his early 30s, which is really exciting. And um, William and I had a long discussion about why do we need a nervous system? The cells in our bodies communicate much faster than the nervous system is capable to communicate information. All the cells in our bodies share information instantly between all the cells in your body. And somehow that has been controlled by the nervous system as we know it in our bodies. Is there, oh is it, did it, see it? Mm -hmm. So, that's just, I'm digressing a little bit because it's, it's a new, you know, as you go through this journey, you start to turn more and more pages of, of occult knowledge and information and we just have to be prepared to change our mind about our previous, um, previous held belief systems. So, I no longer believe today what I believed about that symbol yesterday. And that's the way it's got to go. So, this is the translation that we get. Let us create a Lulu, a primitive worker, the hardship work to take over. Let the being, the toil of the Anunnaki carry on his back. I think it says it all. And then it continues. A primitive worker shall be created. Our command will he understand. Our tools he will handle. To the Anunnaki in the Abzu relief shall come. And then I discovered just very recently that this very famous Sumerian seal, which, uh, which is often described as the creation, the creation of Adamu, or the first human being. This guy here is holding a cone-shaped device in his hand. <laughs> You know, until now I was looking at it thinking, oh, it's a vial or something, you know, he's holding a flask. No, it's very much a cone-shaped tool. So, again, the plot thickens. <laughs> so, what kind of stone, what kind of stones are the ruins made of? And made up of a very specific kind of stone. It's known as um, Hornfels, Hornfels stone. <coughs> named after a German geologist, Herr Hornfell, and it's actually metamorphosized quartzite. As you can see, it's black on the inside, and it's got this reddish-brown skin on the outside, known as patina. And this patina gives us a very distinct and clear indication of the age of these stone tools and artifacts. It's not perfect, and it's not exact, but it tells us that we're dealing with stones and tools that are hundreds of thousands of years old. Why can I say this? Because when the stone breaks, or when you make a tool or an artifact out of it, it's black, like this color, black. And then you leave it lying around, and the patina starts to grow. And it grows very quickly to start off with, but then it slows down as, as quickly as it begins. The thicker it gets, the slower it grows. There are no real true scientific data or, or specifics about this, but the information that you will gather is that it grows so slowly that by the time you see the first patina, when you see the patina with your naked eye, it's already well beyond a thousand years old. So if the patina is several millimeters thick, we're dealing with something that is not just a few thousand years old, but way over a hundred thousand, two hundred, probably beyond three hundred thousand years. Most of the stone tools and artifacts that I've been finding have got patina on it 
that's at least a millimeter thick and sometimes up to a centimeter thick. So we're dealing with extreme ages here. The other important thing is that these stones ring like bells. You can see several of these, they look like French loaves. French loaves of bread. Um, and ring like bells. <laughs> and to show you, when I discovered that these stones ring like bells, everything changed for me. And I realized we're dealing with sound technology. Resonance and sound as a source of energy and technology. And this is just to show you how they ring like bells in my little museum. See the cone shaped tool in my hand? It's a thick patina, so it's quite dull, but you can still hear the effect. And this is a beautiful one. This one actually rings at two different frequencies. second most abundant element on earth and that is silica. We're looking at silicon based technology. Silica has memory. Silica conducts light, conducts sound and now that we know that we can store digital data in crystals and this is also not information that is spread on the 8 o'clock news on CNN that you can store trillions of terabytes in one small crystal, that's not good for business. So you're not going to see it on CNN. In fact, hold on to your crystals because very soon we'll be told that crystals are dangerous to your health, crystals cause cancer. And we must give away our crystals. And men with guns will come door to door collecting crystals. Like they did with the gold. <laughs> so we realize that these ancient stone structures are actually giant memory banks because silica keeps the memory. Remember that the only reason we use silicon based technology, we, we, the way we use it today, computer chips and the te most advanced technologies, all silicon based technology, um, is because we want to sell it to, dumb, to some dumb schmuck. Right? If we wanted to use the silicon based technology, in its natural form, you don't have to extract it out of the source. So in essence, the, the technological industry did the same to, to technology as the pharmaceutical industry did to ancient knowledge of healing. They extract the silica, put it into shiny metal boxes, and then put it on shelves in shops so they can sell it and make money Pharmaceutical industry, take the active ingredient out of ancient plants that people have been healing themselves for, for, cells, for, cells, for thousands of years. They extract the active ingredient, they put it into a bottle, and then they sell it to us. 
And then they pass laws to outlaw the plants because they're bad, dangerous to humanity. Same thing. It's all about control, controlling the species. So silicon-based technology is this left in its source. The stones are powerful tools that carry information. And this is what makes us realize that these ancient tools are actually giant machines. These, all these ancient sites, ancient structures are giant machines. Resonators, energy devices, activated by light and sound. And this is why they are aligned with the movement of the sun. North, south, east, west. Solstices, equinoxes. And you realize that as the sun comes up, the light, and remember, every light has got a frequency associated with it. So it acts as the activator to switch the machine on, to start performing a function. It's like hitting a key on a computer. As the light comes, it hits the machine at a certain point, a certain angle, down a certain tunnel. It activates the machine. And the machine starts to perform some magical function that we don't yet understand. And at the equinox, it does something else. At the solstice, it does something else. And when the sun goes down, maybe switches off the machine or makes it do something else. So we've got to recognize that these are giant machines and, and that they're still active. We know they're active because you know, the measurements we've been taking. This is a spectacular photograph taken of one of the pyramids clearly showing us with a special lens that something weird, some weird energy fields are coming out of the pyramids. And you've seen this, these spectacular beams of energy being emitted from the various pyramids around the world. And um, our famous pyramid just up the road from us, an energy beam, electromagnetic nature, 28 kilohertz, 4.5 meter radius, focused and continuous energy coming out of the pyramid. The fact that symmetrical interference patterns have been measured in Stonehenge clearly tells us that it was designed by intelligence, intelligent design. It's not just random things going on there. And somebody did a really amazing diagram of Stonehenge showing us the channel and the direction in which the energy was, would have been flowing based on this construction. And this is very consistent with the stone circles in South Africa. But where is the flagship among all these millions of stone ruins in South Africa? Undoubtedly, it is Adam's calendar. When I was introduced to it by Johann Heiner in 2007, it was just called the calendar. And then I had to give it a name because I wrote a book about it, so I came up with the name Adam's calendar. Little did I know how close to the truth I was when I called it Adam's calendar. Because these are two, these are, by the way, these are the two central calendar stones right in the middle, aligned with north-south. When I met with Baba Kredo Mutwa, um, preeminent Zulu shaman, a knowledge keeper of great knowledge of our planet and everything else. He told me that he was initiated, he was, this thing is a bit high, sorry. He told me that he was initiated there in 1937 as a young shaman. And that it's well-known ancient site by the African knowledge keepers, and it's called Inzalo Yelanga, or birthplace of the sun, where humanity was created by the gods. And then I asked him, well, which god was it? And he said, his name was Enki. And suddenly we have a connection between Sumerian texts and ancient African knowledge, and a forgotten ancient site on a cliff in South Africa, and things start to get really interesting and exciting. This is Johan Heiner, the very first day that I went there with him, showing me the calendar. He spent five years decoding it, measuring it, analyzing, realizing it was a very important site. 
The way it works is this stone casts a shadow on that stone, as you can see the shadow, and it starts on this edge, and the shadow moves from the summer solstice on this edge every day of the year. You can tell every day until you reach the winter solstice on that edge. It stops and it comes back. So it's still an accurate calendar, and you can still use it if you wanted to. But it's a little out of sync probably because it's leaning, the stones are leaning slightly towards the edge of the cliff. This is what it looks like from the helicopter. That's the edge of the cliff. It drops about 200 meters down here, eventually a kilometer down into the valley. And um, it's a circular structure originally. That is north, that is south. Those are the two central calendar stones. And north-south runs between the two calendar stones. That is marker there, that's where the stone man used to stand. I'll show you him just now. And um, north and east, west-east, marking the rise of the sun, and over there lies, at that stage it was still covered couldn't really see until we uncovered it later. The Horus Stone. This is a 3D reconstruction. We put the stone man back in its place. Baba Krena Witwa calls the stone man the clitoris of Mother Earth. He calls it, also calls it where Adam Scalander, he calls it Oenzalo Yolanga, he says this is where heaven mated with Mother Earth. Now in there is encoded more information in Semitic language, where heaven mated with Mother Earth. DNA of the Anunnaki was transferred into a new species on planet Earth. There's your Horus stone marking the rise of the sun, looking at these three stones that mark the rise of Orion over there when it was flat on the horizon, not at an angle. At the moment, Orion comes up at about this angle. But if you look at star maps from ancient times, it keeps moving up and down the horizon, and it keeps going... Oops. <laughs> it keeps moving up like this, and then flat. So it keeps moving around as you look at passage of time. It keeps going flat and moving up. So at some stage during that that giant, those giant cycles, um, those were aligned. Over there, between those three stones, we, uh, we found some very interesting things that happen, especially to women, uh, when they stand in there. And um, apparently that is where some of the genetic or fertilization process happened in ancient times. Uh, but that's too much information for now. But I'll